What is going on everybody? My name is Kincaid and welcome to episode two of the Honda CR250 build. Trenton, who was the winner of the YZ300, was here last week and just seeing how stoked he was to win that bike makes me even more excited to keep going on this build. As you can see, tons of parts have arrived since the last episode was posted. I have been hard at work planning out this entire build and getting parts ordered to make sure that this is an immaculate bike for one lucky winner. If you haven't entered to win this bike yet, you can do so by tapping or clicking the link on screen or in the description. So later in today's video, I will talk a little bit more about these parts behind me, but the overall goal of today's video is to tear down the bike even further. That includes a complete engine teardown, stripping and prepping the frame, and tearing down all of the suspension components. I will be sending out all of the parts that I won't be refinishing or repairing in-house, to the respective people and companies that will be helping out. I will of course discuss each of these people and companies as we approach those points in the video. So without further ado, I really hope you enjoy this episode. I plugged up all of the openings in this engine before washing it, although truthfully I wasn't overly concerned about getting a little water in there since the cases would be split shortly after anyway and it's getting all new bearings. A little water really won't hurt anything given I'll be able to fully dry and prep any components that are getting reused in the engine. The first thing I did in the disassembly process was install my piston stop tool. If you know you're fully disassembling an engine when the top end is still installed, this is actually a really nice tool to have. It takes away the need to use a gear jammer for the primary or flywheel holder tool for the flywheel since you can just rotate the engine until the piston is stopped by the tool. The oil that came out of this thing was a nasty shade of gray, although fortunately there were no metal shavings in that oil. It was definitely time for an oil change, but it didn't appear that it had gone so long that anything would be damaged. I was incredibly impressed with the condition of the clutch basket. There's hardly any signs of notching. I'm not sure if the basket has been replaced before, but it appears to be OEM and I was very surprised how nice it looks. Disassembly of the clutch side went very smoothly and I have no concerns about any components. Truthfully, of all the engines I've disassembled, I was surprised to find that this bottom end appears to be one of the least abused. Here you can see that I'm able to remove the primary with no clutch or gear jammer. I turned it by hand until that piston was stopped by the stopper tool and then I felt comfortable using my impact. One nice thing about this impact is if I can't break a bolt with my ratchet, I probably can't get it with this impact either. It isn't so strong that I worry about damaging components, but it's strong enough to get most of them. I know people have mixed feelings about when to use impacts, and I've certainly done some damage with them in the past, so I sort of decide on a case-by-case -case basis and just use my judgment. Now check out this authentic reaction as I see the inside of this cylinder for the first time. I had quite a few comments on the first episode of people either asking if the bike ran or stating that it probably ran. Nope. Check out this piston. The ring and the piston became one. Wide open throttle in the St. Anthony Sand Dunes will do that. Nice work, Corey. Speaking of Corey, he's the guy I bought the bike from. He had broken his collarbone and was looking to clear out some of his storage unit for medical bills. He said he blew this CR up about two years ago and it's been sitting ever since with ambitions for a rebuild that simply hadn't been executed. I brainstormed for a while how it might be possible to get this bike back in Corey's possession when it's done but of course, I simply can't afford to build a bike and then just give it back to him. But that's where I have an idea. If you would like to help give Corey a chance to get his old CR250 back fully revived, put entries for Corey in your order notes and those entries will give Corey a chance to win his bike back. Now, if you just enter for yourself, I don't blame you at all, but I thought this could be a cool way to bring this community together. With the cases split, I was able to inspect the transmission and crankshaft. As it turns out, this bike is actually running a Wiseco crankshaft, which is what we put in the YZ300. So seeing the condition of this crankshaft is good peace of mind. The transmission looks perfect with little to no signs of wear on any gears or the shift forks, and even the bearings are in impressive shape. These cases are getting fully stripped and Cerakoted, so the bearings are getting removed and replaced anyway, just so this thing is completely fresh and ready to go when it's done. To remove crank and transmission bearings, you can either put the entire case half in the oven and let the bearings fall out, or you can heat around the bearings with a torch and then persuade them out with a bit of impact or a slide hammer. The screwdriver you just saw was a prime JIS screwdriver. The bolts you see retaining bearings in the engine may look like Phillips heads, but they are not. JIS has a slightly different shape and the last thing you want to do is strip out a retainer bolt in the case. Been there, not fun. 
I ordered a set of three of these screwdrivers on Prime and Max, and I really like them. Not only have I quit stripping JAS bolts, but these have a really nice ergonomic handle and they're my favorite screwdrivers in the shop. Now take a real good look at this cylinder before it goes off to Millennium Technologies for replating because it's going to return looking brand new. Millennium Technologies does an outstanding job, not only on replating, but other engine services as well. I've been sending cylinders to Millennium for about five years now, and they never disappoint. My cylinders always come back perfectly in spec and looking absolutely stunning. With the engine fully torn down, it was time to shift my focus to the frame, where I am so thrilled to announce I'll be working with Charles over at MX Revival. Guys, if you're not familiar with MX Revival and you like what I'm doing over here on the channel, Charles is an absolute wizard with bike builds and his attention to detail is second to none. I stumbled upon his channel when he built an unbelievable YZ250 called Thundercracker and I've been learning cool tips and new ways to work towards perfection on these builds ever since. Plus, he's just a good guy who's been willing to help anytime I've reached out with questions. He's currently building a Gas Gas MC500 two-stroke called Hellfire that one lucky person will take home, so I would highly recommend you check out that build series over on his channel as well as get yourself entered to win. Charles is also donating a portion of all entries to OMC Raceway, which is absolutely awesome. So, how are Charles and I working together, you ask? Well, he's established a reputation as the best in the business when it comes to vapor blasting parts. I'm going to send Charles your CR250 frame, and it's going to come back looking literally better than new. I can't thank Charles enough for this opportunity. I understand how much time this blasting takes and how valuable his time is, so to have MX Revival play a role in this build is unbelievably exciting. So in order to make Charles' life as easy as possible when he gets this frame, I'm going through and working to remove all the dirt and all of the grease so it doesn't contaminate his cabinet, and I'm also going through with Primamex cleaning wheels and removing imperfections from years of good times. To clean and degrease this frame, I used a combination of supplies. For my degreaser, I used Super Clean and switched between submerging the frame in a degreaser bath, meaning my igloo cooler, and scrubbing it with a degreaser soaked scotch Bright pad. Between each iteration of degreasing, I would spray the frame down with the power washer, first with this power washer soap and then with plain water. This allowed me to force any of the grime that had loosened up off of the frame and see what was left. For the hard to reach places, I used Dawn dish soap and a toothbrush before switching over to the Dremel. I like Dawn because it's actually pretty effective at removing oil and grease and the way it suds up can be easier for scrubbing than using an actual degreaser. So I just texted Charles to see if my work on the frame is up to snuff. Good enough preparation for the vapor blasting. He said it is looking good so it's time to figure out how to fit this thing in a box. <laughs> Well, Charles, I'm not sure what boxes containing frames usually look like, but managed to get it done by combining two boxes and using a whole lot of uh, Gorilla Tape. So I apologize that you're gonna have to deal with this, but the frame is in there and secure. Stoked to see what this thing looks like when it gets back. So that's it for the frame right now. We're gonna move on to ripping apart the suspension. The reason the suspension is next on the list is because I plan to send the fork stanchions and shock shaft out to Daniel Schmidt with Evo Industries, who has a connection for DLC coating. If you are unfamiliar with DLC coating, essentially it's what you see all of the factory teams running with their suspension that also results in some beautiful colors. The benefit of DLC coating, aside from looks, is that it reduces friction between the stanchion and fork seal, ultimately resulting in better performance out of your suspension. It is also a harder coating that is more difficult to damage than the standard coating that comes on the stanchions. I have never had this done to suspension before this project, but I just wanted to go that extra mile on this CR250 build, both for looks and performance. Also, if you followed the KX250 Revival series, you may remember the joke about having my shirt off to increase female viewership, but in reality, my garage is just incredibly hot in the summer and I've yet to do anything about it. So, Tarps are optional, good buddy. Tarps are always optional. So this is my first time ever removing fork lugs from the stanchions. I watched Cameron Niemla's video where he did this on his CR250 build years ago, which was super helpful to show me how it's done. The head of this set screw stripped a bit, so I switched from the two millimeter Allen to a T8 Torx and was able to get it removed from there without issue, but that will need to be replaced when it goes back together. 
I ended up using the tusk fork clamps I bought recently to secure the stanchion in order to get the lug off, and I was concerned about clamping down that tight on the stanchion, but it ended up working without scratching up the stanchion at all. I was very careful, and this took me quite some time, but after many failed attempts to loosen the lug, I ended up torching the lug for around 2 minutes instead of the 20 to 30 seconds I had been doing, and that was enough to break down that red thread locker and get the lug removed. With the forks fully disassembled, I moved on to the rear shock. It took me a minute to figure out how to remove the spring, since this Showa shock has a little bit different design from shocks I've worked on previously, with a retaining ring holding the spring plate in place. The two plate components were seized together from years of dirt buildup, but I ended up getting them apart with a couple love taps. I cleaned up the shock body with some soap before disassembly just to limit the amount of dirt that would contact the internal components. In the past, I have struggled to remove the retaining rings from the bladder and the shock body, but in this case, they actually came out pretty smoothly. I had a hell of a time removing the shaft and seal from the shock body. It was really tight in there. After pulling with all my strength and nearly passing out, I realized that this was probably a work smarter, not harder situation. I gave the lower plate a couple taps which loosened that shock seal, and from there I was able to finesse it out of the shock body. From there, it was just a matter of removing the shim stack, seal, and other components from the shaft. This was also my first time ever removing a clevis from a shock shaft, and for this I also took notes from Cameron Niemela's video. Similar to the forks, this required a lot more heat than I expected, and it took me a few attempts before finally torching the clevis for enough time to allow it to break loose. This is the farthest apart I have ever had suspension, which is really cool and of course a little intimidating. The focus at this point was to polish up these fork stanchions and the shock shaft to near perfection so that they can be DLC coated. For this, I utilized a polishing wheel and compound from Prime MX. As you guys know, I've been using Prime MX cleaning wheels for years and I didn't realize the results could get any better, but Cameron just continues to develop new products that step up the bike build game. Huge thanks to Cameron and Prime MX for supporting this build. I read through the polishing wheel instructions since I've never done this before and got to work. I first degreased the components in order to not contaminate the polishing wheel and then I put on my respirator before beginning at the buffer. Guys, I'll be honest, when I started using Prime Wheels, I sort of took the instructions to wear a respirator as a recommendation rather than a requirement, and I regretted it. Some nasty particles go airborne, so if you do this at home, don't skip out on this step. I started with a fine cleaning wheel on the threads to remove all of that thread locker, and here is a side-by-side -side comparison before and after. From there, I moved on to the polishing step to get these tubes all cleaned up. By the time I was finished, there were a couple minor scratches you can see if you looked hard enough, but I didn't want to go too much farther. So hopefully there is a good enough finish for the DLC coating to be done properly. Again, this is my first time doing this. Overall, I think these turned out incredible and I can't wait for them to come back coated. Wow! This has been an incredibly productive couple weeks working on the CR, the frame sent out, the suspension components are sent out, and the cylinder is sent out. So from here, it is time to put some serious time in the shop, prepping components, and starting to get things rebuilt. I have to say, Cameron Niemela's CR250 build seems to be the bike build that really got this all started. At the time, when I saw that video, I had already started working on bikes and flipping dirt bikes, but hadn't really started doing high quality builds. I think that video has over 6 million views, and every time I watch his build, I am in awe at the quality of his work, his camera work, the editing, the whole thing. So if you haven't seen Cameron's CR250 build, I will also put that on screen and in the description. That build is seriously an inspiration for me. I never expected just a few years later to be building a CR250 of my own, and I hope to reach a fraction of the caliber that Cameron does on his builds. So I promised you guys I would talk a little bit about all these gorgeous parts behind me. I will go much more in depth on each of these parts in future episodes, but for now, I just wanna give you guys a preview of what you can expect for this build. Let's take a look. What you see here is a 2008 CRF 250 swing arm, which is actually a little bit lighter than the OEM CR swing arm, and it looks a little bit better, so that's a nice little upgrade to the bike. Moving on, I decided to go with the Mylar's Super Cool Radiators. These have quite a few added benefits over OEM radiators and are significantly better than other aftermarket radiators. I also went with a set of red radiator hoses, also from Mylar's. That color scheme is going to look great on the bike. We've got some core MX foot pegs from IMS. These provide great rider connection to the bike 
and we'll be using titanium foot peg pins from Warp 9. Of all the items I replace on builds, I generally don't replace bars, and I know that bothers some people, so we went with some brand new bars from Pro Taper on this one. I've also got some frame guards from Prime MX, which also improve your connection to the bike, as well as a ton of Pro X rebuild kits. You guys know I've been using Pro X on my builds for years, but now Cameron over at Prime MX actually stocks all of these parts directly on his website. So if you order Pro X parts at PrimeMX.com, you'll actually be supporting two great companies. We've got some gorgeous anodized red triple clamps from Ride Engineering that have some benefits over stock. They have some different flex characteristics as well as a different offset that will allow the bike to handle like a more modern machine. Now one of the most simple and effective upgrades you can do on these older two strokes is to replace the front brake master cylinder. I've got a master cylinder from a 2023 Sierra 450 and the impact this has on braking ability is incredible. Now while I often rebuild wheels for my bike builds, I went with a fresh set of wheels from Warp 9 on this one. I wanted a true anodized hub on this one rather than doing any coatings myself. So these turned out incredible and we went with the titanium hardware. Sticking with that anodized red look, we went with a fresh cylinder head from Fathead Racing. These have interchangeable domes that allow you to change the compression ratio on your bike. Here's a preview of a couple of the Cerakote colors that we'll use so you have an idea of the direction this bike's going. And last, but most certainly not least, we have an absolutely stunning exhaust pipe from Huga Performance. These pipes are handmade in Canada with 18 gauge steel and I truly don't believe there's a header that looks better than Huga and the performance is top notch. So if you're looking for the most beautiful exhaust pipe that money can buy, be sure to check out Huga. So guys, you see where this build is headed. If you want a chance to win this thing when it's done, don't forget to get yourself entered. Like this video, leave me a comment on what you think about the progress so far and all of these gorgeous parts and please don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you'd like to follow along with the series. Stay tuned for episode three.